So good morning. What a great building, apart from the elevator, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's quite, quite scary. Okay, so here's the future. Good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be with you today. The view is rather limited, but otherwise it's nice. Buongiorno, è davvero un grande piacere essere con voi oggi. La vista era piuttosto limitata, ma altrimenti è bello. That's not bad, huh? That's Italian. So, interesting, the other day I was in, uh, I was in uh, Tokyo and I had a half hour conversation with a sushi chef. I spoke German and he spoke Japanese through this device. As long as you can keep it basic, it works. So now there's a new device coming up where you, you wear an earpiece and the other person also wears an earpiece and you don't actually have to have the mobile and you can speak to each other at a different language at the same time. Right? Like Star Trek, right? So two years for this technology to be 100%. So as long as you speak a mainstream language, you know, not Swiss, German, or Finnish, you know, uh, you can actually have a relationship with anybody right? through this device. Uh, so science fiction is becoming science fact. We have a situation where things that used to be theory are now actually working. Self-driving cars, language translation, intelligent machines, uh, maybe not quite yet. Right? But language translation, I mean, this means basically in three or four years, maybe five, we're just going to talk to computers. Right? No more typing. Right? And this is uh, like, like talking to a friend, you know, Black Mirror, right? <laughs> so you can sit on your couch and you can say, I want to see uh, Kojak, you know, 1984. You know, that kind of dates me, but uh, episode number four, you know, and where he, where he, where he sucks on the, on the lollipop, right? And boom, it will just play. And in a couple of years, we just sit down the computer and we say, give me the projection, prediction of sales for the following country under the following parameters, and we'll just spit it out. Okay. Uh, this is all kind of, yeah, you know, pie in the sky type of stuff, but I have seven principles I want to share with you today. First, I want to show you what my job is. My job is not to predict, but is to listen. Right. Most of my job is to observe, and pretty much observe the obvious, I would say. Right. Um, but 95% of my job is to observe and to think about what happens in the next five to seven years. So I do the opposite of my clients, which don't usually observe very well. You know, they're very good at executing. But I also do this. I take complex scenarios and I help clients understand the way forward. So I work with 47 people around the world in different industries. We have to realize, and I'm sorry for the, the screen cuts off a little bit here, so, but I'm sure you can imagine the rest. The future is no longer an extension of the present. That is because the things that we have seen as a limit, you know, technology, social things, globalization, uh, technology in general, spread of the internet and so on, they're finally here, you know, so basically what's happening is that, you know, we always think of the future as being an extension of today, but it's no longer true. This is very hard to understand for us because, for example, if you're in the car industry, you used to sell cars. And what's the future of the car industry? Um, mobility not to own a car. I mean, if you're in the real estate market, the future is probably that people will share the office. 50% of people are going to be in the gig economy in 15 years. So that changes everything, politics, society, culture, social contracts, pensions, also longevity. You know, we're, we're rapidly getting older, all of us, right? So every year we're gaining one third of the year in longevity. The kids of my kids will be 100 years old on average. That's a mind-boggling idea. So you can retire with 63 and then, you know, we have 37 years on the cruise ship, you know? <laughs> so it should be great for the cruise ship industry. But, you know, I used to be in the music business and, you know, when I was in the music business, we actually sold music, you know, the little round things. Remember those? Uh, called CDs, you know? I mean, today, if you buy a CD and you give it to your kids for Christmas, they call a therapist. Right? I think you have some sort of mental problem. You know? But I used to sell CDs, and the future of the music business is not to sell music. Right? Spotify doesn't sell music. I mean, 10, what was it, 21 million songs on Spotify are available for 10 quid. Right? I mean, we used to spend 20 quid on one record, right? So Spotify doesn't sell music, it's free. What does Spotify sell? Convenience, peace of mind, interface, design, features, like Netflix, same thing, right? We don't, 
uh, we don't subscribe to Netflix because it's cheap movies. You know, it just it works, right? So that's really hard to understand. And really, what that means is, you know, is what I call the end of good enough. Right? So uh, this is very common, of course, in uh, in banking and insurance and other. Uh, companies like this, you know, to where you said, well, what we offered was good enough, and there wasn't much of an alternative, right? so you couldn't leave. And now it turns out in banking, for example, 74% of kids are ready to skip the bank and go to an internet company for banking. I mean, here in this country, Lloyds Bank, right, to make this huge shift towards, the, I think, 2.5 billion pounds into innovation, right? This is N26, German bank. A German kid leaving home right now is certain to sign up with this bank. It's a virtual bank. Right? I think they have several hundred thousand per week signing up. It's completely digitized, and there's, there's no physical building. And of course, you know, the fees are essentially zero compared to the other banks. Right? It's a mind-boggling innovation. And here you have a chart of uh, Accenture showing basically the GAFA, you know, Google, Apple, Facebook. Their increase in banking it looks like this, and then the fintech companies the digital leaders like Lloyds and others, right? And then you have the language. <laughs> it's pretty clear language here, what is happening with good enough. Netflix surpasses cable TV. Cable TV isn't good enough anymore. I mean, today, if I have a 25-year-old kid that moves out, they just want high-speed internet. That's it. Everything else is somewhat in there somewhere, right? Uh, Spotify is a great example. People don't buy records anymore. And Amazon is the purveyor of good enough. Right? Amazon is the new good enough. It's mind-boggling, you know, if you look at their progress, you know, every time Amazon sees some weakness in the market, they move in with an offering. So Amazon is now getting into checking. Right? Amazon is becoming a bank. I don't know if you heard this news, but just a couple of weeks ago in the US. Right? So 340 million prime customers of Amazon will get free online banking in the next couple of years. No fees, no transaction, free credit card, international money transfers, peer-to-peer -peer loans, all part of Amazon Prime. I mean, if you're a bank, that would put the fear of God into you, I suppose, right? But it's the end of good enough. We're going to have to change things a little, just a tiny bit, right? Jump out of that old fishing boat into the new one. And that is true transformation. Transformation not, is not to stay in the bowl and say, I'm going to grow a little bit bigger. All of us do that every day, but we're going to actually have to transform, become somebody else. And don't be mistaken, you, know, you may think, well, it's not going to happen to us because you know, we're in the oil industry or, or mining or you know, tourism. Or, you know. in, my, in my own business, we used to write research reports, and we were in this fishbowl writing lots of reports, selling them for 10,000 euros each. You know. And then came along Google Trends. Right? You want research, you just go to Google Trends. You know? And now you speak to IBM Watson, you get a research report. Right? I mean, in a couple of years, that's completely automated. Intelligence, knowledge. Right? What cannot be automated? Understanding. Right? Because it requires human perception. Right? As Einstein already said, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. In five to seven years, we will have a computer that will have the capacity of a human brain. In 2050, one computer will have the capacity of all human brains, the calculating capacity. Of course, it will not be emotional or social. I, at least I hope not. Right? But you know, that's going to really change our life, and we're going to be in a world there. If we want to be successful in this place, we have to make a leap, and we may have to pivot. It's my favorite American word, you know. Turn around while you're in the middle of the airplane. Like Walmart, right? Walmart is pivoting, trying to. You know, rather than hiring another, another one million people for some new retail places, they're going online. Right? They're completely pivoting. And most industries will be reset and rebuilt from the ground up. This is very important to realize. You know, the car industry wasn't rebuilt by VW or by Audi. Here came Tesla and Google and maybe General Motors and Toyota, built the car from the ground up. You know, the Tesla is, from the ground up, a software package with a large battery. I mean, it's important to understand this. You know, when we think about marketing or advertising, you know, we're going to completely reinvent advertising, uh, as I'm sure you're aware of if you're into advertising. Advertising is primarily based on surveillance and tracking and noise making. Right? And it worked. 
But now we have better ways. And so rebuilding all that stuff will be a crucial future. Point number two is that we're living in this world where technology is becoming infinitely powerful. And humanity, which is you know, sort of ephemeral things, you know, <laughs> feelings, understanding, emotions, you know, they're sort of converging. It's really hard to understand how that actually will play out in the future because technology is becoming so powerful, but what I call ethics in technology, digital ethics, is a key differentiator. How, how safe is my data? How much do you use tech to replace people? Do you still have a soul? Yeah? Does your company have a soul? This is the key question, actually. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many companies say, well, we're going to innovate and we're going to transform, we're going to fire as many people as possible, and use tech to increase the margin. And double revenues in five years. Okay, that's a nice idea, but you know, what do you actually stand for? Do you actually mean something? And then when I ask the question, I get the answer, well, we're going to double revenues. That's not a meaning, just so we don't get confused. You know, <laughs> Doubling revenues is not the meaning of a company. So in this future, we're looking at the fact that technology is essentially both of these things. Right? It doesn't have ethics. I mean, technology can be used for good or for bad. That's just the nature of technology. You know, nuclear energy, the telephone, television. I mean, you can be addicted to television. You don't have to go to Facebook for that. Right? So here's a key question, right? We have to actually use technology like genome editing or virtual reality. Right? We have to use it in such a way where it's mostly like this. Right? Oh, like this. <laughs> I was thinking of Facebook, you know, pointing over there. We have to use it in a good way. It's not that we don't use the technology, but when we use it too much, it becomes evil, you know, it becomes toxic. So when you go to some restaurants in Southeast Asia, you're sitting around having dinner, you know, there's every single family with kids, everybody has two devices, two, that they're dealing with at the same time while they're trying to eat. Right? I, I will call that toxic, right? It's, it's kind of hard to imagine, this happens everywhere now, right? Uh, the other day I was in Greece and the, uh, on Santorini and the restaurant owner kicked out a bunch of people that were working on their devices the whole time making calls and, and, and not actually enjoying the view which was like 200 miles out into the ocean. <laughs> you know? I mean, so that's, that's the challenge of technology. Right? And when you talk about ethics, it's not anything really fancy. It's really the idea of saying we may have the power to do this or the right even but we choose not to do it. And this is what went wrong with Facebook. Right? It wasn't a crime, it wasn't a hack, so it's hard to say what exactly happened, right? But it's ethically irresponsible. And ethically speaking, Facebook is responsible. So three weeks ago I left Facebook as a result after 10 years, you know, and uh, my traffic went down about 70% on my website. Right? I'm sure you know how that feels. But that's going to happen every day now. We're going to have to think about how ethics will influence this, this Barbie doll, for example, that Barbie launched two, uh, two years ago. Uh, this is a toy for kids that connects to the cloud. So a four-year-old can speak to this toy, and the toy will learn who the kid is and make smart responses. So the benefit being is that the kid can learn that most people are machines. Right? That's that's a good side effect, you know. So there was a lot of pushback against this, and they took it off the market, I think. But this is the kind of, you know, it's interesting, but is, is, it, is it a good idea? You know? This app called Replica replicates you. You give it all the data that it wants, and then it can act like you. And the prime purpose is to act like you when you're dead. That's the, that's the purpose of this app. Right? And, and, and technically speaking, it works. Right? So you give it all the video and audio, and, you know, Black Mirror, right? You, it's here. <coughs> Don't try it. It's, so, no comment on that. But you know, the, the pathetic thing about Facebook was not actually what Mark said in Congress, right? Which was actually not bad. Is the pathetic questions of the politicians. Right? I mean, all of us could have asked better questions. <laughs> like, come on, you know, do you understand what Facebook actually does? But anyway, so I think for our businesses, it's important that we maintain the license to operate. 
the permission to operate. Whether you're in advertising or marketing or public transport or whatever, that what you do is responsible in a larger sense. I mean, Unilever, for example, is one of those companies that's trying to do this. It's very hard, right? Because it's, it's cost money, but on my, uh, you know, I, I junked Facebook as a, I removed the license to operate in my life. Um, but I think we'll have more of a story there in the long run. So here's the thing, you know, because we're connecting everything now. Right? We're connecting our driving, our food, our digital money, our healthcare records. I mean, in five to seven years, we're going to be so connected that the benefits will be I mean, imagine all of our healthcare records and DNA in the cloud. We can solve huge medical problems just by having the intelligence. But when we do that, who's going to safeguard what we are? I mean, the day will come that we're going to have 100,000 clones of people that have their DNA in the cloud, right? Literal clones. And this is not science fiction. That's certainly not something you would want for your life, I don't think. Right? Uh, I mean, there's people already cloning their dog, which is a different story, but... Um, so the more connected we become, the more we have to think about this, you know, how do we actually make sure the human is still inside? And I guarantee you, if you just connect people and you make that work, that's great. But if you don't do this, you will not be successful. That's what people want, right? They want to connect to others. You know, the most important thing for humans is not technology. Maybe hard to understand today, <laughs> especially when you're talking to 20-year-old kids or so, right? But it's to connect to other humans. I mean, human happiness is defined by relationships, primarily. Right? And I don't mean relationships with the screen. I mean, you know, actual relationships. Point number three, exponential technologies, exponential change brings heaven or hell, right? It can be fantastic, it can be terrible. I think it's 90% heaven. I'm an optimist there, but you know, it could turn out bad if we had a surveillance state, you know, uh, see what happened in Turkey, you know, how social media is being used in Turkey to put people to jail. Right? And who is in charge of that? Would it be us? Or companies? Uh, well, to some degree, I mean, you can say you're going to opt out of Facebook. Uh, that's hard. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can do that. But it's really the government that needs to do it. Right? And this is, of course, a challenge because most governments don't really understand these issues very well. You know, that's, uh, that's going to be the future. But, you know, we're looking at this, you know, we always have the same cards we had for thousands of years, you know, these kind of morals, values, and then technology gets a new card every day. Right? And so um, it's the state, the government, that needs to think about how this all comes together. Right? This is why we have the GDPR. GDRP? No, GDPR. Right? Whatever. Something like that. This is why we have regulation, right? and this is very hard to think about because, you know, we are, basically the bottom line is we are in an exponential state of change. And when you think back 20 years, we're talking about the paperless office, you know, uh, remember Napster and the music, music in the cloud and all that kind of, it didn't work. I mean, I started a company like Spotify in 2001, and we fried several million dollars because it was too early. Right? We were here. But now we're at the pivot point of exponential change. We're at the takeoff point. And lots of people that I talk to, they're saying, well, you know, we tried this like solar energy or whatever, you know, 10 years ago. But it didn't work and we lost all our money. But now it's different. Now we're at the takeoff point. We have all these things, the Internet of Things, intelligent assistance, quantum computing, and, you know, the sky is the limit. When you go up 30 times on the exponential scale from four, that's one billion. That's 40 years, roughly, maybe 50. So our world in 50 years will be one billion times as far as long in terms of technology. Not in all technology. So even hard to imagine what that means, right? But, you know, we're looking at changes that, you know, basically this wave of change is now rolling over all industries. First music and media, telecom, communications, and so on. And so I talk about future readiness a lot, and future readiness is really three pieces, okay? Because the future is no longer about the time, it's about your mind, right? It's a, it's a mindset. The number one defining factor for the future of your business is whether you have a future-ready mindset. And that includes, you know, thinking, understanding exponential, combinatorial, how things are coming together, uh, interdependent and holistic business models. 
And this is what all the successful companies on the, on the list prior, right? This is what they do. They think like this, they think like this, right? and they reinvent and they do other things. Right? The future is no longer a time frame, it's a mindset. So here you can clearly see, you know, in this mindset, you know, the connected mindset, all these things that are uh, uh, influencing each other are creating a new opportunity. And it's kind of hard sometimes to understand all these things because, you know, new ecosystems are coming, quantum computing is here, roughly seven years we'll have machines that are a million times as powerful as today. So any job you want to give them, you know, running a hundred trillion data feeds, no problem. You can 3D print things. We've talked about 3D printing for 20 years, never did anything. Okay. But in the very near future, we're gonna print all of the auto parts we need on demand. Right? The UPS truck will be a printer. Right? Will not actually bring the pieces. Right? And we have these possibilities of, you know, getting all the data from people, Google Home, right? Anybody here using Google Home or Amazon Echo, right? Alexa? Yeah? That's essentially what it does, right? Jumps inside of your head, fishing for information. Listen to what you say. The mega shifts. I don't have time to go into great detail here, but in my book, it's chapter three. And basically, it's not just digitization that's changing our world. It's all the other stuff that, that vapors around it, like augmentation, datafication, automation. I'll give you some examples. So here, for example, if you take the car, right, you can see how these mega shifts have changed the car and how we're essentially facing the, the end of the car, as I like to call it. I mean, being from Germany, this is a pa painful subject, right? Um, but, you know, what we see here, clearly, you know, autonomous cars will search, even though I don't think they'll be truly autonomous in the sense of, like, what we do with them. But level three or four would be plenty to change the entire city of London and do away with parking, right? Electric cars are the future. Every car company has said they're gonna stop making cars with gas engines. Every company. And they talk about 15 years, but they really mean five, right? So, I mean, look at this, you know, transportation as a service rather than owning a car. It's a huge business opportunity, but is it gonna work for BMW? They're used to much higher margin. I mean, the cost of per mile is declining for the user because of this kind of services. And this is the Tesla, right? Starting from scratch. So what's happening here is that this whole idea of, you know, how the car is defined is impacted by the mega shift and changing it. So very important for us is to take a wider view. And I see again and again the most successful companies, this is what they do, right? Sales, revenues, projections, planning, execution, efficiency. Well, I'm going to tell you efficiency is for robots, right? Efficiency is for machines. That's what machines do. And what we need to do is to go take a further look and say, well, you know, we're not talking about CDs. We're talking about music in the cloud. We're not talking about physical cars. We're talking about connected cars, mobility. We're talking about not the banks the building, but the bank digital. So taking a wider view. The other thing is that, you know, now we have this you know, saying, and it's been said many times, data is the new oil. That's a very old thing, right? But it's finally true. Artificial intelligence is the new electricity, which means that you have the data, and then you have a machine that understands how to read the data. Because humans can't read a trillion data feeds. You, know? you need the machine. In marketing, this is crucial, like marketing automation. And then the Internet of Things connecting traffic, devices, everything. As I said earlier, this could be a nightmare. It could be fantastic. I think it's gonna be great, but we're gonna to have to agree on what we want. Right? We don't want these guys to make social decisions. Right? Well, you'd be surprised, you know, there's the first companies proposing we should replace the judge by an AI. Right? My hunch is that Trump is already an AI, we just haven't found out, you know? That's why he likes to tweet sort of automatically, right? As Kevin Kelly says, you know, we're moving to a future where first we digitized and now we cognify, yeah? we make, make things smart. And we jokingly call this a smart converter. This is McKinsey says roughly $62 trillion business. Taking the old stuff, putting in the converter, out comes smart. Smart city, smart farming, smart health, maybe even smart government possibly even smart banking. So this is the future that we're facing. You know, there's a, 
uh, AI everywhere. Spotify has AI, Airbnb has AI, uh, these guys have AI, and this is what the list is of AI. You, you can download the slide later to take a better look, because I have to wrap up very soon, as you can hear. Uh, but many people have said intelligence is the new UI. AI is the new UI, other user interface. And that's going to be very true in just a couple of years. You know, advertising as we know it and search is going to be gone in five years. I mean, who would go to a machine and type in best sushi in London when the machine is essentially in your head? Or you can just speak to it. I mean, when you speak to a machine, you say, I'm looking for a sushi place that's not too expensive, that has the following, where my friends have gone, that's close by, and the machine says, boom, here you are, and I have a coupon. Try to do that on a search engine. So getting into those machines, if you're selling stuff, that is the ultimate. Because if you're not in there, you won't even exist. So I'll wrap up by saying that intelligent machines will change our world more than any other invention. And again, I think that it's mostly positive, but we'll have to get used to the idea that machines can actually do things, you know that they're not, no longer stupid. I mean, looking at this, uh, what IBM calls cognitive computing, you know, we're now going to a world where uh, essentially the computer systems can think, not like we do, but they can analyze things. Right? They can make their own decisions. And we should not overdo this, I don't think. You know, we need to be very careful because this is human intelligence. Right? It is actually totally unclear how we do all of these things. And that's why we haven't succeeded in building this. Because machines don't have emotions, social, kinesthetic, you know, body, emotional intelligence. That's the stuff that we have built in. Things that humans decide in 0.4 seconds, like, you know, if you're a threat or if you're interesting, or that takes 0.4 seconds when we meet. The machine needs years for this to analyze. So let's not get car too carried away, right? I think there's a, there's a chance that these guys will get too, too smart in 50 years. But for the time being, these are as dumb as a toaster right, compared to humans. That doesn't mean we can't use them. We can use them. But we shouldn't trust them in the sense of a black box, you know, just saying, well, the machine has said, you know, and so that's it. It's like TripAdvisor. And who would trust TripAdvisor, right? I mean, it's interesting, but is it real? It can be. I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, you know, when you use TripAdvisor. It can be quite good and real, but like a person, right? Machines don't think like humans do. So uh, that's also why I think we should not give machines too much power. We shouldn't give them the power to upgrade themselves. And this is where it gets dangerous around you know, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, where we allow the machines to connect that's kind of like asking for trouble, right? So I always say that intelligent assistance is fine, but AI to me is a rather scary topic. Yeah? So I'll wrap up saying by basically that we're looking at the end of routines for jobs. Right? Any job that's routine, machines will learn. Any. That includes a scientist, anyone. We'll just take a little bit longer. A speaker, right? now you have the first TED conference where it's only robots that will do the talking. I like to say jokingly, that's kind of like what we have today. I'm just kidding, yeah. Because <laughs> they all say the same thing, but... <laughs> no, I do love Ted, but anyway. Uh, I don't think that means the end of human work. I think that's a little, we have to give ourselves a bit more credit than that, right? Because if we let go of the routines, fine. You know, can we... You know, are we going to become useless because we don't put in data anymore? Or drive a car? Yeah, if that's all you do, then you you're going to be useless, right? But can you rise above that? Can the government help by figuring out how to create new jobs and train our kids differently? Because this cannot be replaced by machines. That's 95% of what we do. Understanding, negotiation, storytelling, invention, creation, thinking. Maybe machines will learn that in 50 years. You know, I think for the time being, we're quite safe there. So very important, you know, the percentage of human-only work will increase, tr increase dramatically. If you have kids, you've got to think about that. Their jobs won't be here, you know, doing things that machines can do. They'll be 100% human-only, jobs that only humans can do. So I think that's good news. It will take quite a bit of, uh, 
of understanding. But you know, to summarize, basically, we should not concern ourselves too much with efficiency. You know, the CFO loves efficiency. Everybody loves efficiency because it makes money, right? But efficiency isn't human. If it came down to efficiency, we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be allowed to exist. No, because we're not efficient, right? We waste so much time, we make up things, we have feelings, you know, all that stuff we don't need. Really, yeah? So we have to use technology not just to be efficient, but to create new things. Right? That is the holy grail. That's what's really transformation. Everything else is innovation, which we need. But it's really about creating new things using technology like Airbnb and others have shown. The other thing is that, you know, we need, we need motivation to change, right? How do companies change? I've been doing this now for 15 years. There's only two ways that we'll change as people and as companies, pain and love. So if you're in a company that doesn't have enough pain, there won't be change. If, if there's no love of new ideas, there won't be change. So your job to drive your company forward is to inject some pain if needed, you know, to say what if, right? and to bring up some new ideas. You know, humans are not actually driven by this realization on the spreadsheet saying that we can double revenues if we do X, Y, Z, right? Well, that's kind of interesting if you want to, you know, buy a new Tesla or something. But it doesn't drive people. So keep that in mind when you think about this. Finally, let's keep in mind that we are driven by technology. All these changes come from technology, but we're actually defined by humanity. Companies are defined by what they stand for, what they say, what story they tell, what purpose they have, and whether you can trust them. As Peter Drucker used to say, a variation of Peter Drucker, culture eats technology for breakfast. So thanks very much for listening, and um, hope to see you later. <laughs>